Good morning. Welcome back to TSC this fall, or this spring. Wow, I'm really behind. A whole semester behind. Welcome back to TSC this spring. How does that sound? It's good to see you back. We're glad to be here today. Stand your feet. It's been an interesting start to the semester already. We uh, lost a day, which I'm sure you were all very, very disappointed by. We got some snow. I recommend, or I, or I recognize a few of you, I think, from the uh, hillside. I was out here on Monday with my two kiddos sliding down the snow and throwing snowballs. We had a lot of fun. So that was unexpected and enjoyable. Maybe not so much being out of power for two days. I don't know. How many of that, how many of you did that affect? Not so fun. But you survived. And you're here. Psalm 145 says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. That's what I want us to do for a few moments this morning. On his wondrous works, on his mighty acts, let us meditate for a few moments. I challenge you, cross this room, close your eyes just for a moment. I want you to Meditate for a moment on the mighty acts of God in your life, on His faithfulness. When you yourself are unfaithful, when those around you perhaps are unfaithful, His faithfulness endures forever. His mercies are new every morning. As he reveals himself that way to you in your life, maybe in recent days. I hope your heart is full. Now turn this way and let's turn that into praise. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more.
Good morning to Cold Falls College. It is so, so good to see you guys again. Uh, what a crazy start to the semester. Let's go. Who got out? Who, who slept? Who went slept? All right. Everybody get out and just enjoy. Who, who was not at all going to have any of the snow business and just stay inside? Let me, let me see that. You, you, I hear you. I hear you. I had to scrape my car this morning, and it kind of felt like, you know, I moved south to get away from the snow. It's still here. So uh, I hope that you all are excited for a new calendar year, a new semester. I'm excited. I'm excited uh, for what's to come. Um, at the beginning of this year, I just felt this weird, just, I don't know, feeling of optimism that 2022 is going to be a fantastic year. I hope you guys are feeling that as well, and I hope that that uh, ends up being true. Um, today, I've invited uh, Pastor Terry Brown uh, to come and share with you all. Uh, we're not related in any way. He just has a really cool last name. Um, but before I bring him up, um, I just have a couple announcements. So first of all, spiritual formation credits. Most of you are going to be earning 30 credits again this semester. Um, if you are a commuter, your I attended will still say 30 credits right now. It's going to take us probably a week or two to adjust things. Oh, there we go. All right, you can hear me. Um, uh, we, we adjust things based off what the registrar sends us, so it takes a little bit of a time. So just bear with us. That is coming. Um, it's going to happen. Um, but right now, uh, it will say 30 for all of you, and slowly we'll get that sorted out. You all should be pretty familiar with the check-in process by now. Um, I just want to emphasize that it is your responsibility to make sure that your app is logging and that things are working out. So when you come in these doors and you scan the QR code, it should show up right away that you have a credit logged. Um, if it doesn't, um, go ahead and see one of my assistants of grace and folks with the lanyard, and they'll help you get everything sorted out. Uh, B groups. I highly encourage you all to join up with the B group this semester. It's a great opportunity for you to get to know some different people and uh, focus on some uh, various topics in the Christian faith. Uh, I think we'll have sign-ups open for that next week. I'm a little bit behind in getting things set up, still figuring out leaders. But So we're going to do a digital uh, sign-up again with a form that goes around. So be on the lookout for that in your emails uh, next week. Uh, finally, I just want to highlight some leadership opportunities. We have two leadership opportunities through the Office of Spiritual Formation. First of all, we have a couple more assistants of grace that we're looking out for. And those are folks that just help with uh, chapel check-in and are around for any other various tasks that I might need them to accomplish. Um, second, we are in need of one or two more people to join up with our decor team. Um, we got uh, some good folks that are a part of that that can do some fantastic stuff, but uh, we also need some folks that are able to set things up and make some of these ideas and designs happen. So if that's something that interests you, either one of those opportunities, uh, just sit me and we'll get you set up with that. All right, our speaker this morning is Pastor Terry Brown. Uh, Terry's a TFC grad, and uh, he currently serves as the student pastor at First Alliance Church here in Tacoa. Um, I don't know if you all saw Bedside Baptist, and I attended, was the title for this morning. Um, that's a joke. He does not preach at Bedside Baptist. Um, I don't know if you guys say this now, but back in my day, uh, we used to say, if we skipped church on Sunday, we would say that we went to Bedside Baptist with Pastor Pillow. Um, and we heard preaching on the Holy Comforter. That's what, we, that's what we would say. That's really dumb, I know, but I'm a dad, so I get to do dad jokes now, and some dumb humor is, is okay for me. Uh, I really like Pastor Terry. Um, he's got a lot of energy and passion, as you will see, um, but more than that, he's just one of those rare people that'll actually listen to you and care about what you have to say, which I think is a quality that I appreciate more and more in life. So please, uh, give Pastor Terry a warm welcome. So you can I really wanted to do the uh, coming through the middle to feel like I was on the, like, the Jimmy Fallon show or something. But... Uh, that didn't work. Oh well. <laughs> Story of my life. Things that I want to happen don't. But uh, so I am a TFC grad. Um, Nineteen. Yeah, way back when it was still nineteen. Nineteen ninety six. Um, so I've. It's been a while. 
Um, I was so excited when, when uh, Jordan asked me to speak in chapel, I began to visualize speaking in chapel. Uh, we used to go to chapel every day. Uh, we had chapel, so you guys are like, oh man, we, we go to chapel enough. So imagine going every day. But it was in the gymnasium. So imagine having to sit on the bleachers every day for an hour and ten minutes. So you are so fortunate to have those beautiful looking comfortable chairs. So um, I'm, I'm a little jealous. But, uh, so I have uh, kind of been around the block. I'll just give you a quick tour of my ministry just so you kind of get an idea of where I'm coming from. Uh, graduated in 96, uh, went straight into ministry, into youth ministry. I uh, was in youth ministry in North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania. So uh, any, any Western PA folks? Just a couple. Usually, usually it's like half the group. So um, we're diversifying apparently at TFC. That's a, that's a good thing. Um, from youth ministry, I went into associate pastorships. Um, and then I went into church planting. Uh, from church planting, um, I went into um, kind of missions. Um, but uh, I spent seven years in the United Methodist Church um, doing youth ministry, doing student ministry, and uh, pastoring. Uh, from there, I went to church redevelopment, and I spent three years redeveloping a church uh, in western Pennsylvania, uh, which was, that was fun, right on the ridges, so we got to ski a lot. Uh, so when I saw the snow, I hated it. That's why I moved south. If you want snow, drive north. Should not be in the south. Um, and now I'm back to student ministry. And, uh, and in a sense, it was all student ministry. Because at some point, we're all supposed to be learning something. And uh, I hope you guys are enjoying your time here learning stuff. Um, I, I spent two years as uh, an on-campus student. Uh, <clears throat> let's just say my GPA reflected that. Um, but then I had a change. I got married, and I had a kid. My GPA shot way up. That is not the way to get your GPA up. Please don't make that your goal. Uh, if it's to get your GPA up, great. But, you know, um, I was fortunate enough to, to meet my wife, and uh, we had three kids. And, um, and now I'm on staff at FACT, at First Alliance Church, um, as a student pastor and the only grandpa on staff. So, loving it. Have a, a almost two-year-old grandson. So, uh, man, nothing better than that. So... Just so you get a little picture of me, I've been in ministry for almost 27 years, um, and it has been fun. It has been hard. It has been frustrating. It has been amazing. It has been surprising. It has been not surprising. It has been all of those things. But for 27 years, well, I will say this, in everything, I've been able to watch and see and experience God do some awesome things. And, and he's taught me some awesome lessons, um, some of which I cannot share with you, uh, but some of which I'm, I, I'd like to try. And uh, um, I'm one of those people that <clears throat> learn best by failing. I wish that was not the case, but it is. As I've gotten a little older, I've, I've began to, to learn how to learn from other people. Um, and, and I hope this morning that it, I just have a couple things to share with you that you will um, maybe engage in some of that learning from someone else who's failed enough times that uh, you, don't, you shouldn't have to. But. So how many of you were in a dorm that had no power? Cold rooms? Oh man, cold rooms. Um, I didn't lose power. I was warm the whole time. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even lose internet. So, so you know, I could stream movies and stuff. It was great. Um, but, uh, of course, uh, so when I was here, I was in Forest Hall. Um, I was on A-Wing uh, for a semester, B-Wing for a semester, and then I was on C-Wing. Woo! C-Wing. Um, because that was the only wing that had air conditioning. None of the other rooms had air conditioning. You're like, wow, that, that's just wrong. <laughs> I agree. I 100% agree. That was just wrong. But, um, I, you know, it was interesting to, you know, we used to have, uh, you know, when, whenever it got really cold, 
you know, us northern folks, Woo-hoo. I'm not a northern folk, but y'all northern folks. I came from Texas, so I even had to come north to get here, okay? Um, but the northern folks, they're, they're all outside, they're in shorts and a t-shirt, it's like 30 degrees, they're loving it. You know, and us, us southern, you know, Texas folks, we're, we're freezing. You know, we're looking at the thermometer, we're going, okay, it, it, where's the rest of it? It should be up here. You know, like 89 degrees was starting to get cold when I grew up. You know, triple digits were fine. We didn't, that didn't bother us. But then when I moved to the north, oh, that was like missions all over again. (laughs) So for all you northern people, God bless you for living there. But now you're south, so enjoy it. But I want to ask you this question. Which are you? Are you a thermometer? Or are you a thermostat? You see, a lot of times as we go through life, we choose to be one or the other. A thermometer simply takes the temperature of what's around it. It can tell you whether you have a temperature or not. You can tell you whether water should be solid or not. It can tell you a lot of things. But it simply is an indicator of your surroundings. Where a thermostat is different. A thermostat chooses and is controlled to move the temperature to where you want it. Now, for those who are in cold rooms, you're like, man, I wish I could turn that thermostat up. I wish it worked. I wish there was power behind that. My daughter, who lives with us, she's, uh, she's 22, or no, 23. She's our youngest. She, uh, she, she's cold-blooded even more than me. And so we, we have our thermostat set, and every now and then she turns the thermostat way up. Now, I like it. I'm like, hey, I'm sweating. Great. My wife, she gets a little hot. She's like, turn that sucker down. See, the thermostat changes the temperature of its immediate surroundings. So what about you? Are you simply a reflection of the circle of influence that you run in? Are are you simply just an indicator of the things that the world is beating down upon you? Are you simply a thermometer? Can people look at you and and, and just see see the the reflection of what your life is? or, Or will you choose to, with power behind you, be a thermostat. That you will choose to work to change, even just by one degree, even just by a little bit, change what's going on around you. Your friend group. Your influencing. There's a new term that, that okay, I'm, I'm almost, you know, I turned 49 in a, in a couple of months, so I'm, I'm my, I call my kids when I'm trying to figure stuff out. Um, I did download Twitter one time, and apparently I did it wrong, and my kids took it off my phone and told me I wasn't allowed to have it. So I, I like technology, but this new term, influencer. Yeah, you will not see me on social media doing that. But how are you influencing? How are you changing the temperature of the rooms that you walk into? How are you changing the temperature? And understand this, a thermostat has a thermometer in it. It it, it has to know the temperature to know whether or not to blow cold air or hot air. The other instrument that um, I wanted to just share with you before we get into our scripture passage this morning. Um, I grew up in Texas, as I told you. One of the things I love about Texas are storms. Anyone like storms? Anyone like you know, I, I love storms. In Texas, you're out there, it's, it's just you know, space forever, and, and you're looking across there and you see these clouds. Top of the clouds are probably um, between 70 to, to 100,000 feet to the very, very top of these thunderclouds. And you're looking like, 
Oh, we're going to have a storm in a couple of days. I mean, they're that far away. But you watch them. You watch them build. You watch them grow. You watch, you know, you watch the shelf clouds and, and all the things that go on with the storm. And then, and then the storm hits. The cold front comes through. The, the warm front, whatever it is, the storm hits. And, and man, it's, you know, in Texas, we don't have like, you know, when we have hail, you can go play baseball with it. You know, I mean, the storm's coming and it is a storm. Awesome. Now, every, you know, we got storms around here and, and uh, but tornadoes and one of the storms that we always, you know, I lived close to, uh, uh, close to the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, whenever there was a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, that was always the best time to go, uh, to go surfing because at Galveston you'd actually have waves. Otherwise they were just, you know, like one of these numbers. But we'd always look at this instrument called the barometer. Does anyone know what a barometer does? What does a barometer do? Measures pressure, measures pressure in millibars. So, so it measures the barometric pressure. Okay, to know, you know, and so as you're watching this, much like a thermometer, a barometer can tell you what's about to happen. Hey, the, the pressure's going up, the pressure's going down. We have a, that's why there's a high pressure front or a low pressure front. You know, it can tell you, and, 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 and depending on what the readings are, you can tell how severe a storm is going to be. And I remember a couple times the storms, you would get up into that, into that uh, anything over 900 millibars of pressure, that was going to be a fun storm. You know, I remember one storm was like 1,100 millibars of pressure. They were like, that was dangerous, it was scary, but you know, when the tornado sirens go off in my town, we all ran outside and looked up. I didn't say I was smart, I just said I like storms. Okay? It was so funny. You go out and you, you see these storms and you, you feel the thunder. You know, when it hits and it just like shakes you. It feels like someone's banging on your chest. Awesome storms. A lot of us are scared of storms and that's okay. They are powerful, aren't they? That lightning and the thunder and the clouds and the rain and the hail. All the things that go on. The wind. Just reminds me of, of the power and the awesomeness of God. But am I simply a barometer? Am I an indicator of God's power? Am I, am I a storyteller of God's, of God's presence and power in someone else's life? Or, or, hey, God might be doing something over there. Too often we embrace the barometer because we're scared of the storm. We want to just be an indicator because we don't want to get too close. Down south, they have these, this really cool job. It's called storm chasers. Who would like to do that? I've done that. So fun. You're literally chasing the storm. You're watching the indicators. You're looking at the temperatures. You're all this stuff goes into effect. And you are running after the storm. Reminds me of a story that we read in Scripture. Jesus had put his disciples in a boat and said, hey, just go. These guys were fishermen. They had been on the lake. They knew this lake. You know what story I'm talking about probably. They knew what was going on. So they, so they get out in the lake. And, and in the middle of the night, literally midnight, between midnight and 2 o'clock in the morning, there was a, a massive storm that, that kicked up on the lake. And they're, they're, it's so much so that they were scared. And so Jesus comes walking out. How'd you like to have that on your resume? I walk in storms. He came walking out to them, and they, they were terrified. And even in his fear, Peter decided, I'm going to embrace the storm because that's where Jesus is. And he said, Jesus, if that's you, I don't know if it's you, but I don't know anyone else who might be walking on water. I don't know anyone else who might be walking to us in the middle of a storm. If that's you, tell me to come. And I will trust you. And I will, I will do whatever you ask me to do. He says, come on. And that night, Peter walked on water. Peter walked in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the night, because Jesus said it was okay. See, you can either embrace 
The barometer would simply be an indicator in your life and in your ministry and all the things that lay in front of you. Or you can begin to embrace the storm because often that's where Jesus is. Now both of those things, the barometer and a thermometer, have a control. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to, I want to, go to the book of Hebrews. Because I, I use those two illustrations as kind of a setup. You have choices. You have a lot of things that are laid out in front of you. When I got, when I got to, uh, to Tacoa in 1991, I crammed four years into five, if you're doing the math. For me, I was sitting my senior year about this time in 1991, 31 years ago, that's, that feels weird. I was watching on television in my high school the beginning of the first Gulf War. None of you remember that because you weren't alive. Some of you, I see some older than 30. I almost, you know, for that I was like, oh, that is so cool. I want to go to the military and do that. See, it looked like a video game before video games looked like that. And it wasn't until the end of March, 1st of April of 1991 that I finally heard God in the midst of all the storm that was happening in, in my life at that point in time. And I stopped simply being a thermometer of, oh, well, here's what's happening in the world. Or here's, here's what might be going on. And saying, I'm going to embrace what God has for me. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background to help you understand why that was such a, a, a hard decision. In high school, I buried four friends. A grandparent. And a dad. High school was not great for me. I lost half the side. I lost my dad's whole side of the family from, from a family fallout. And so I didn't. When I was leaving, I felt like I was leaving everything. I was not going to even be able to come back. Because my family was coming apart. My dad passed away in 1988. In August, in December, my mom got remarried. I was 15 and a stupid kid and didn't like that at all. I felt like my world was falling apart. That's the storm. And for three years, I was in that storm. I was in that storm because time after time after time, I made bad decisions. I lost people. It was hard. Every time I thought things were going good, it, it turned. Now, there were some great times. I had some fun. High school was interesting. You know, I'm glad I'm not there anymore. I'm so glad we did not have any social media when I was in high school. I don't think I would have survived high school if we did. Certainly not without a criminal record. We make dumb decisions, don't we? Things we think are just not going to be that big of a deal, and they turn out to, to be life-altering. But as I was leaning into what God was doing in March of 1991, something happened in my church. I was going to a small little Bible church. Um, the, the pastor's name, don't laugh, the pastor's name was Ron McDonald. No D, just McDonald, you know. And I began to see things I'd never seen before and experience things I hadn't experienced before. And I hope that, that you've had a chance growing up to experience that and maybe in the church that you go to or, or wherever, wherever you find that fellowship. But I didn't experience that until that year. And through that, through that time... 
I heard God's call to ministry. I heard God say, hey, you know what? I, I know, I know you, you've had a rough time. I know you're hyperactive. I know you have ADD. I know you have all this stuff. I get it, get it. So I'm going to make you a youth pastor. Well, that just seemed to make sense to me. Because everyone had told me, because I had issues, everyone had told me that, that he's just not going to do anything. You know, you know those, those kids that you see coming and, and you know, everyone walks the other way? I was one of those kids. I passed third, third and fourth grade because the teachers didn't want me again. I'm not kidding. I couldn't read and I could barely write when I got to fifth grade. See, that, that, that spring of 1991 as a senior in high school... As someone who's like, you know, I'm just going to go to the military because that's easy. Because everyone else has been telling me. I've been the thermometer and a barometer for everything else my whole life up until that point. And God said, this is not who you are. You are part of the family of God. And I have something more for you. And I had no idea what that meant. And even when I got here. I struggle. I don't know how, how you guys have struggled. I don't know how you guys have done it the last two years. I got here in January 1st, 2000 was when I got to, to First Alliance Church. Got here, I was all excited to start student ministry, and then we just locked everything down. It was hard, wasn't it? How many of you guys went through 2020? A few of you? A lot of you? You're like, oh, don't remind me. You know, this is 2020 also, right? I hope not. I hope it's different. But I want to share with you what God has taught me over 25 plus years of being in vocational church ministry. Now, I, I, I told you a lot about my family past, just so you'll understand this. You see... When I was at home, my parents took me to church every single Sunday. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, if the doors were open, we were there. So much so that if I got in trouble and I got grounded, I don't even know if they do that anymore. You're grounded, you can't go to church. What? Church is it, man. Church is where you get food. Church is where you find dates. I mean, no Jesus. <laughs> you remember, I was a teenager. You know, church was, that was my whole, that was my lifeline. And I didn't even realize what God was doing at that point in time. And as I started into vocational ministry, as I, as I started into churches in, in North Carolina, and then Florida, and then Pennsylvania, and then Ohio, and then back to Pennsylvania, and back and forth we go, I began to see something and began to have this thing in my mind. And I want to share it with you. And I just want to say this. Stop going to church. Stop. Stop going to church. And start being the church. That's what God was showing me. Because if you're going to be the church, I want to share with you what that means and what that looks like. Because anyone can go to a building. Anyone can walk into a hall. Anyone can go to a beautiful uh, uh, cathedral. That's not church. That's not what my Bible says church is. Stop going and start being. And God was teaching that to me. Stop doing ministry. Stop, stop trying to do church and start being the church. Being the bride that I've called you to be. Grab your Bibles and go to Hebrews 10. Because I'm old now, I have to have glasses. So now my Bible's really, really clear, but you're really blurry. So sorry. Just going to have to take that. In the book of Acts, we see that the church was started. Now, the church was started by godly men and women, right? 
The, the, the apostles and the disciples and, and the, those that were there and, and the Holy Spirit started this thing. But it was led by men and women. Hopefully controlled by the Holy Spirit. When they started churches, they weren't like the churches we know today. They were fellowships. They were, they were imagine having this many people in a smaller, I mean, imagine a, a room a third this size and we're all crammed in here. For days and days and days on end. Thinking, wow, that sounds like the door. <laughs> they were groups. They were fellowships. When we drove up to Pennsylvania to see our grandson over Christmas, my daughter rode with us and, and we, I listened to, they watched the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy in the car. You know, that song was seared into my brain. But it was a fellowship. A fellowship that's meant to do something, to go somewhere. What's the quest that God has you on? What is the thing that God is, the people God has put around you? You see, if we choose to be the church, that changes. That we cease to be a thermometer and a barometer. We cease to be the indicator and we start to be the change. Because when we embrace the thermostat, we, we begin to change just a little bit. Change those around us we, by, by how we love them, by our attitude, by our actions, by our sacrifice, by, by even how we encourage them with our words. We become a Holy Spirit-empowered storm. We quit being an indicator and start being that thing that changes what's around us. And that may scare some people. Hebrews 10. I want to go just several things that we get when we start being the church. When we start being the church instead of just going and showing up and getting or doing or whatever it is we're doing and then going home. When we start being the church, it's not for an hour on Sunday morning or Wednesday night or just in B groups. When being the church is every moment of every day. And when we do that, we see verse 19, chapter 10, verse 19. One of my favorite words in the Bible is therefore. Anyone know the rule for that? Do what? Therefore, find out what it's there for. Okay? So usually when you see a therefore, you go back and read like the, the previous half chapter or chapter before that. Because he said all that to say this. It's kind of what, how I see that saying. Therefore, brothers and sisters... You see, when we become the church, when we act like the church instead of going and doing the church, we have a family. And for me, I told you those things because that meant everything to me. I had parents in every single church. Some of them I liked and some of them I didn't, just like all the other parents out there. I had grandparents. I had, I had my family grew. It didn't shrink. I was brought in to other people's worlds. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. It says you are blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. We live in a world that's competitive. Get yours, get yours. And, and yet, in the family, when we discover who we really are. It took me about 10 years to figure this out. I hope it doesn't take you 10 years to figure it out. But you have a family. You have brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, aunts, uncles, grandparents. You begin, your family begins to grow. And it's even better because you don't have to get them all Christmas presents. Okay, no one can afford that. But you begin to find out who you really are as you are in the family of God as you place yourself there. Second one is we have confidence. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have confidence. How many of you have confidence in your walk with Christ? Confidence not because you know what you're doing. I have a piece of paper from this institution. Terry Brown. B. 
BS. <laughs> it took me five years to figure out how much I didn't know about who God was and who I was in him. I thought I had it. But man, as God has shown me, there's a confidence that comes because we have joy in the family. We come through trials. Christ deepens us through our faith. You see this in these passages. It brings wisdom when we ask. The third one we see in verse 21. Look at there. Verse 21, it says, um, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, we have an advocate. I have an advocate fighting for me. I, I grew up and I never felt like anyone was fighting for me. Now, I, I have other people fighting for me. They, I have an advocate. Do you advocate? Do you, do you intercede for your friends on a daily basis? In Romans, in 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians, we see these, these, these Christ as our advocate. Verse 22, and I'm just throwing these out to you. I want you to, to hopefully go back and read through these and, and understand and let the, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let us draw near to God, verse 22. Let us draw uh, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Verse 23. We have forgiveness and we have hope. Verse 24, it says this. Let us consider. Let us consider how we may spur one another on. Now, I, I grew up in Texas. It took me a long time. I had to go to Ohio to learn to start riding horses. But I, I competed. It was fun. Spurs. Woo! You get the wrong ones, that's a bad thing. You get the right ones, it's awesome. Do you take time to consider how your thermostat can change the room? Do you take time to consider how your storm might help somebody? Or do you just want to go through and tear down trees? You have a purpose. I was told for years as a young kid that, that I was going to be nothing. I didn't have a purpose. And the guy says, you know what? No, I made you just the way you are. You have a purpose. Consider that time. Do we take the effort to, to help people love better, to do better, to fellowship more often? Do we encourage one another to the deeper life in Christ, or are we happy just to tweet something? Think about that. Are you called into the family of God? Have you embraced that? Or are you simply being a thermometer and a barometer? Don't be an indicator. Embrace what God has made you and who God has called you into. Read through Hebrews and ask, God, what do you want me to do? I'm going to pray for you, and then um, if you want to chat, I'm here. But if not, I know some of you got class. Lord, I, I thank you for who you are and who you've called us to be. God, I thank you that you, you have more for us than we can even know and imagine. Draw us to yourself as we draw close to you. I pray in your name.